Blunt UK podcast, episode three. You're greeted here by me, Davey. Alan. I'm Simon. And I'm Tony. On this podcast, we're going to talk about the command line versus the GUI, Mythbuntu, the production process when we, um, when we make the podcast, and also a bit about the news. Sounds good. Let's get on with it. I don't know who said it, but there is a theory that if you're using the command line to do something in Ubuntu, it's broken because you should be able to do it with a GUI. I wonder what you thought about that. Well, I, th- I think it's very much what, you, what you're used to. Uh, I'm very much used to using the console even for things which you can do graphically, probably easier graphically. But I, because that's what I'm used to, that's what I prefer. However, if I was a new user, then I may well end up using the GUI more. And I think that for everyday users, they shouldn't have to use the GUI. But they should be aware that it's Shouldn't have to use a GUI or shouldn't have to use a command line. Sorry, shouldn't have to use a command line. And I think that they should be aware it's there and know that they might have to use it for something. What's so scary about it? Why why should someone not have familiarity with some basic commands? The problem is they're not basic, are they? The command line is not basic. You've got to know what you're doing before you can use it. Well, no. no. If you said to me, how do I upgrade a system? How do I upgrade the packages on my system? Then I could either say, you know, you follow this menu path, system, blah, 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 or you press the orange button in the toolbar on the top of the screen, or you open a terminal and type this command. Either way, I'm conveying to you how to do it. It. Sure, but it's a, it's one of the stumbling blocks. You, you've got to know the command before you can do the command. Yeah, but you've got to know the menu before you can choose the menu. See, isn't the point? Isn't the point with um, the menu system is that you can just explore it. You can just poke around, try the different options until you find something that you want. Whereas with the command line, you're presented with a flashing cursor. Uh, unless you know what the commands are you're looking for, you, know, you can try to use things like apropos and, and man. None of us live in a bubble. You know, a, a large proportion of us have access to documentation, whether that's online. You know, you you have online help in Ubuntu and there's uh, help on you know Google and whatever I don't know I find it difficult when when someone says oh I don't know how to do anything or I don't know what to do they clearly have zero Google skills or you know not haven't even bothered trying to read a manual when they stare at a, a console or is that too harsh I think it is a bit harsh we sit in the room and we ask each other. We sit on um, an IRC channel and we ask about things rather than spending hours and hours searching through Google or mm. reading man or, or making error. I fell into the trap initially of, of you know popping into IRC and asking everybody, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? Well, and you only learn by searching yourself. Of well, to some degree, I mean, some people learn learn by being shown how to do something. Some people learn by actually you know doing going off and finding it themselves. But if somebody shows you um, a specific thing, then you don't learn about the the theory behind it you don't learn about um the so, shell if you if you ask somebody about a specific command you don't understand or or but some people don't want to some people just want to know how do i upgrade my packages yeah how do i how do i install you know whatever game i don't care that the program d package does the install and it's held in slash var slash lip you know they just really don't care they just want it installed well going back to what you said uh, simon i actually have a different tolerance level if someone i know is complete newbie uh, i know that term is not necessarily correct but You know, if someone who's completely new comes in and asks a question where it will turn up in the first hit of Google, I don't mind telling them the answer. But if it's anyone in this room here turn around and ask a really simple question that's obviously available in Google, I would, you know, say, here's a Google link. But that's because we're friends and, you know, we can rib each other and stuff. Well, I don't know. I mean, people who I've known for a year in maybe the Loco channel, if they ask the same questions, I I probably would do the same thing. Well, take yesterday, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day, I think it was the day before, we spent how long? with someone in a channel trying to help that person who was clearly quite inexperienced with Linux Mm -hmm. and we got them from they had a server install when I think they wanted a desktop install and they wanted to get from a server install which only has a command line so they had no option to try GUI tools and you know basically every command we told them they just ran they didn't really care what the effect of it was Mm -hmm. and they don't really care what the underlying infrastructure or why in fact something was broken but I wouldn't be surprised that comes with time yeah yeah totally isn't part of the issue that it's easier to help people via command line than it is via the GUI. With a command line, you can paste a string into a wiki or into IRC or whatever instant messenger, and you get some text back out that you can then look at and go, yes, that's worked, or yes, that hasn't worked. Trying to describe how to do something in the GUI, you know, click uh, applications, add new applications, search for this string, click apply, click yes to add uh, extra repositories. It suddenly becomes a a much uh, longer description, and then 
you have to get screenshots if you have a problem that you want to debug and yeah. just, you're hoofing bandwidth around and, and graphics and all sorts so it I becomes had, slower I had exactly that problem about a year ago on a, a Linux user group mailing list someone asked a question it was something really basic like how do I install Kause or something like that and I just replied sudo apt-get install Kause uh, which you know is a this, it's not a wrong answer it's the right answer and because it was an email I was able to reply to that person with one line giving them the exact answer and I got berated by someone else on the mailing list who shall remain nameless um, because I didn't explain the graphical way of doing things and it's the Ubuntu way to use the graphical interface and you know what if I was a new user and you're telling me to use the command line and what I think I'm getting at is I try and tailor the answer for the audience if my brother phones up and says how do I you know install some application then I'd tell him how to go through Synaptic the fact that you were able to give one line which is precise and would do exactly what they wanted maybe that is a better solution no the console is scary because people have never used it before most people come from Windows where everything is done on the GUI you know I was there what is the command line and it was scary and it is scary to new users well most and, most people under the age of what 25 30 not I wouldn't say most people come from Windows I'd say most people under the under a certain age who are not of a technical background okay those kind of, no I'm not trying to be picky no, no, but no. There, there are a significant chunk of people who are older than us who predate Windows and have used DOS and well, you know, I mean, stuff everyone, and, well Windows 95 was still heavily dependent upon DOS as well I mean yeah you mm. can get away without using it but Windows 3.1 you, you, that was DOS just yeah but there, was, there wasn't much command line work if you're not used to the commands and if you don't know the commands they're difficult to use I mean when I started using Linux I kept a big list of the commands so what's the fix for it stop telling people to use the command line or no not give people more help no I think we need to keep the command line it's incredibly powerful sure use the GUI but have knowledge of the command line so you know about it when you need to or want to use it so should we when we tell people how to do stuff with a graphical interface also at the same time tell them how to do it with a command line individual dependent of course but yeah I think maybe, so. maybe on the forums maybe there should be a tick box to say I want a console answer I want a GUI answer it's tricky because any of these mechanisms by which you're asking for help in a text way like if you compare two ways of asking a question if I'm sat next to you and you're asking me how to do something I might show you how to do it with the GUI because we're both sat there and we can both see it but if you're on the other end of an IRC conversation or you're on the other end of a mailing list or a forum or any other medium which is text based where we can't both see the same screen it makes more sense to use the command line to tell you how to do something yeah I mean it would be really good if there was maybe something like a, a screencast where you could actually watch people <laughs> and actually see how to do these things graphically wouldn't that be marvellous oh hang on I think there are <laughs> there are yeah there are a few screencasts that show people how to do stuff graphically but there's a problem that comes with that they're huge they're much more time consuming to create than telling someone how to type a command line so there's a there's a massive investment in creating screencasts the other option as well as screencasts because screencast is pre-recorded stuff what about um if we had a decent uh, remote control software in ubuntu something not like vnc but vnc based but which allowed you to um in the same way as you do with windows press a button to say i need help and you know allow a trusted person and to, to not worry about nat issues or anything like that yeah for it to just work yeah, yeah. and no matter what your network connection is like whether it's dial up or you know 3g or anything you can press a button that says i need help and you know get someone to remotely control your screen i, I mean i'm a command line user i use it for administering servers and i use it a lot on my desktop because that's the way I learned Linux. But one of the reasons that I find it difficult to just stick to GUI answers for people is not that it's often harder, which it is, but it's that the command line gives you so much power and so much flexibility. I almost feel like people who, who only use the desktop are kind of missing out on on an aspect yeah. of the Linux desktop. If you want to do you know, things like batch renaming uh, files and you can string command lines together, and I know this is it's not something that a new user wants to just sit down and be faced with, but once they're used to a system, once they're, they're familiar with the desktop and, and can fire up the applications and do all their day-to-day stuff, if they want to do system administration tasks, the possibilities are almost endless on, on the command line, and it's almost a shame to deprive people of that or, or not to help them you know, get used to it and get into that and power uh, find the power and flexibility of it. I agree, but it's very difficult because there's an infinite number of command line things you can do because it is so powerful, like you say. But shouldn't we have better front-end 
tools like for a good example you gave was battery naming of files like you get a whole load of pictures from one digital camera photos from another digital camera and you want to merge them you want to move them around and using the command line you can do things like you know change on mass the names of files or if you've got a load of documents you can quickly change the contents of you know change one word in every document in you know with one line do a mass search replace and should we have better graphical front ends to those kind of tools or is that just we just end up with a absolute boatload of well, well we end I'd, up I'd, with KDE, wouldn't we? But I don't, <laughs> but I don't think they would be installed by default. But I mean, I, I would have thought there would be applications out there. I've never explored that, but I would have thought there'd be applications to do that. To do what? That specific task, battery name of yeah. files. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, there I, is. I, I know there yeah, is I think one. There are, yeah. But what about every other possible very, very clever thing you could do with the command line? I don't think you could replace all those infinite things with an infinite number of graphical tools because it's just such high maintenance and it's easier for people to just type a line, you know? It's, it's yeah. the old, you know, Unix thing of do one task and do it very well mm. you can then use those as building blocks to make up some fancy thing that you might only use a couple of times it wasn't worth writing a GUI application to do that because you might not do it again for another year whereas you can put a few commands together with a few pipes um, if, you're, if you've got the skill to do that and do your job well we could always pipe together GUI apps <laughs> how, how, would, how would that work Dave? oh you know I'm being silly it's horses for courses you know, it depends what you're used to if you're used to the GUI then you use the GUI the command line's there, it's powerful. Learn about it and use it if you need to. We've just got to understand that some people are happy using the GUI and don't really want to get involved in the command line. If they want help using the GUI, we've got to you know, make sure that we can help provide help for them in that way, even if it is slightly frustrating at times because we're more used to the command line. We've been asked on more than one occasion how we make this podcast, what we use, and we thought it only best to let everyone know what tools we use and uh, software and hardware so that if anyone wants to have a go at doing this themselves, uh, they know what might be involved. Of course, we're doing it one way. There are a million different ways to record a podcast, and this is just the way we do it. Right, before we get into the hardware, we um, have to write down our ideas and uh, as things come up, as emails come in, as people come up with ideas, of course, we use uh, the ubiquitous wiki. In our case, we use uh, Moin Moin to you know, write down all our ideas. And it's running on a server, a virtual server that we have for the Ubuntu UK website. Yeah. It's, it's a private wiki. It's... But we like to keep the ideas sort of you know these bit secrets so there's a surprise and people are listening to the show exactly and if people want to get involved in helping make the podcast we'll give them access to the wiki and all the other tools we have it's just keeping it out of you know the eyes so that's, of everyone so that's why we put ideas when somebody has a brilliant idea in the bath or on the, the way to work whack it in the wiki and then when we actually come up to the run up to the show and we're actually all, all sitting around saying what are we actually going to record we use gobby which is the collaborative editor and we all connect to that and we can hash around um, the content, sort what order we're going to record segments in, take bits out uh, and add comments. Yeah, and the content that's in Gobby comes straight out of the wiki. So the wiki is great for editing over a period of two weeks between one episode and the next. But then during the four hours that it takes us to make the one episode, we'll all sit there with Gobby open because it's easier for multiple people to, to edit the same document at the same time than it is for us to all commit edits to the wiki. The other thing we actually use is IRC. Uh, we actually collaborate quite a lot during the two weeks in between and actually discuss content and what we're going to do and, and such like that, which, which has been quite useful. And also email. All the emails that come into the show uh, go out to the four of us that are here and uh, Dave Murphy, who was on the last show. Mm -hmm. um, so we can all see comments that people have made and uh, people subscribing to our Twitter feed and things like that. So moving on to recording, how we actually record the podcast, kind of, uh, it kind of depends, really, because some of it is recorded in what we affectionately call a studio. <laughs> Which is usually somebody's front room. Yeah. Then sometimes we record segments outside. So if we start off with the studio stuff... I have had for years uh, a mixer. I got a new one uh, a few months ago, and it's, an, it's a relatively simple four-channel mixer, and it's got a few extra inputs and things. So it enables us to have four microphones all plug in, um, so we can all hear each other via headphones. We've got a little headphone amplifier, so we can all hear what's being recorded uh, and hear each other. And uh, it goes out through the outputs through to um, a Zoom H4 recorder, which is a little solid-state recorder. Records onto SD cards in a WAV format. Um, and that's a great little device. Uh, and that's what we use to record our interviews at FOSDEM, um, because it works independently. So it's very easy, very portable. Stick it in a pocket, stick it in a bag, and off you go. I mean, I happen yeah. to have a couple of fairly decent microphones there, SM58 Shaw microphones, but you could use pretty much anything, really. Yeah, yeah. Again, we're, we're kind of lucky. Alan had a couple of mics from a uh, previous podcast idea, <laughs> and uh, uh, I had one kicking around. But we have bought a, a few little bits and bobs just to help it along. Simon went out and brought another, a microphone and a mic stand. So once we've... Um got this all recorded 
and the master, if you like, is on that Zoom H4 device on a solid state yeah. uh, SD card. Yeah. What happens next? I take it off and I copy it onto my computer and I start chopping it around. T- take out the stuff that's obviously rubbish and then listen to it again slightly more carefully and work out which bits and which segments we want to fit in. Get an idea how long they're going to run for and see what we need to fit into a 40 minute show. That's pretty time consuming, I would think. Yeah. I've heard both the first two shows more times than I might care to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you use for the editing? The first episode was done entirely in Audacity, so open source audio editor. The second episode I did using a mixture of Audacity and Arda. The reason the reason for starting to use Arda is that it's non-destructive in some of its operations. So you can apply filters and, and, and make edits and cuts and things uh, without removing the data from the file, whereas Audacity is destructive. And if you apply a filtering process or an effect and then save it, you've effectively lost the original. So you would have to go back to the very, very original sound files and fish out the bit you wanted if you decided to undo that effect. So I, I've tended to use Audacity for for chopping the segments and chopping little pauses and things out because it seems to be easier for me to do that whereas Arda is great for putting the whole episode together applying processing and just sort of tweaking the layout and sticking the music stings in between the segments so you mentioned the music stings and we've had some positive and some negative comments about the music yeah where did it come from I found it on archive.org we talked about on IRC uh, the sort of feeling we were looking for and the music we're after and I was searching for sort of big band and swing and sort of you know early out of copyright material or creative commons license material that we were able to use in the podcast i found this little piece it was nice and cheery so it chopped it up and it had a nice kind of minute worth of intro music which would be great before any vocals kicked in and there's a nice little bit at the end for the outro and and, and people seem to like it and there are a few people who said oh no get rid of it so tony when you finished um cutting it about and come up with your final product we obviously have four outputs what do you do to produce those four files okay so i end up with a big master wav file and uh, i encode it and i was encoding the first episode quite a lot of times in different ways trying to get the settings right so i ended up writing a little shell script just to do the encoding with the right settings set all the id3 tags in the mp3 embed our little uh, picture into the mp3 file and by the time i'd finished it was reasonably competent had a little ini file and things like that so i stuck it up on my website which is tonywhitmore.co.uk slash repos and it's called Podcoder. Regarding hosting, it's actually hosted on Ubuntu UK Loco server. Um, the web page is actually provided by the WordPress uh, engine. We use various uh, plugins, including uh, PodPress. Regarding mirroring, uh, we've actually, although it looks like a single file, that actually redirects to one of our mirrors, and that helps with load balancing. Mail has had ISO clarification. Oh, good. Oh, oh, good. oh, good. So that means it's now an officially ratified international standard like open document format. So there's now two standards. Yeah. Adobe have released Air for numerous platforms, including Linux. Okay, what's Air? Uh, it's a development environment and runtime environment for running applications coded in uh, Flash, Flex, and something else. So you can run proprietary programs on Linux? Yeah. Ooh. And uh, Launchpad have announced that they now support OpenID for logins. Uh, yeah. Does it work? No. Right. The uh, the Conservative and Labour parties have both been uh, arguing about who um, started talking about open source first, who got on the bandwagon first. They're both wrong. Surely it was the Green Party. Yes. You know what? Who cares? Shout about it. Um, the more the merrier. Let's talk about open source. This week there was the Vulnerability Finding Contest, sponsored by Tipping Point, uh, with the three main operating systems, and Ubuntu was the only one where vulnerability was not found. Tickets now available for Ubuntu Live, the conference that's taking place at the Oregon Convention Centre in Portland, Oregon, July 21st and 22nd. UbuntuLive.com So Dave, you're involved in the Mythbuntu project. What is it? It's a home theatre PC project uh, where basically it's a video recorder which is computer based. Okay, like a PVR. Yes. Personal video recorder. Like a TiVo. Sort of thing you can go and buy from the shops. Yes. So what's the difference between Mythbuntu and uh, a PVR or a TiVo that I can go and buy in Woolworths? Well, I think the difference is, is, the, is the feature set. The fact that you can customise it. Uh, the fact that you can easily upgrade it and that you can connect it to your network and you can watch it on another computer or something like that using you know, actually drag and drop the files and yeah i don't think you can do that with a tivo so i need a full computer to run this 
and he's going to buy a new P4 or a Core 2 Duo. Well, it's funny you say that, because there is actually one of the developers who's running on particularly old hardware. I think his back-end, because it's split on a front and back-end system, you can run it on the same computer, but it, it's split. Um, one of the developers actually running it on, I think, on a 700 megahertz for his back-end, and that's one which always stays on. There is a plug-in to make it so it switches on when it needs to, but most people tend to leave it on the whole time. And basically, that's a very low-powered computer, and all that does is that just does all the recording, and then you have a separate front end which actually does the watching. So wh- what does it record? Well, basically, if it's a Linux-supported tuner card, uh, which most are these days... So a digital TV card. You can digital TV card, analog. Uh, not so much in this country, but abroad they use cable. Especially in America, you can use cable cards. What about satellite? Satellite, yes. Uh, I'm looking at getting uh, FreeSat, actually, which is the new uh, service being offered in, in Britain. Um, yeah, there's, there's also some function, functionality to be able to stream. So what, like YouTube type streaming or? Yeah, yeah. There is a, there is a plugin for that. Um, and not everyone's all that keen on it because obviously the quality of videos on YouTube isn't necessarily home cinema view- viewing. And what can you do once you've once you've recorded? So I've does it does it have like a, a graphical interface? You said yeah. there's a, they said there's a back end and a front end. The back end does recording. Yeah, yeah, the, the back end does the recording, and that also presents um, a feature called MythWeb, and that's actually where you can uh, administer the whole system, so you can uh, set recordings, delete recordings, and even stream through that interface. So any computer that you've got an internet connection point, you can actually set programs to record from abroad and, and stream. So if I'm at work and I, I hear on, you know, or I see on the web that there's a program on later and I'm not going to get home to record it, I could log on via the web to my machine at home and yeah. set it to record. Yep, yep, I've done that many times, yeah. Multiple channels will record, obviously depending on what you're trying to re- record, can I record multiple TV programs? On the new version that's coming out, uh, Myth TV 0.21, uh, that's actually got a multi-record option. And what that means is if you're running a digital free view, uh, you can record any channel which is given on that multiplex. Now, multi, cause basically, uh, there's about six multiplexes, I think, and all the channels are transmitted on them. So basically, if you have two tuner cards, say, you could potentially record up to 10 channels simultaneously. The only limit is is, is, how, much, is how much storage you've got and how fast you can write to the disk. Excellent. All right, because if I understand it, all the BBC channels or most of the BBC channels are in one multiplex. Yeah. So you could record BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Three and BBC Four at the same time with one tuner card. Yeah, I, I think four might be on a separate oh, okay. one, but yeah, 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 give us the same point. Yeah, wow. You can, uh, yeah, so you can record BBC One and BBC Two at the same time. The only problem is, is when BBC One... ITV and Channel 4 have interesting things at the same time. And they're all on different multiplexes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So you're going to need a lot of storage space for all this. It, it, it's quite a large file f- format, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you're looking at about a gigabyte an hour. So if you have a 100 gigabyte hard drive, you're looking at a storing. Yeah, but is that one gig an hour for one, for one channel? For one channel, yes. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean I, I'm quite, you know, I, I, I'm quite into it now. Um, so I'm running, I've actually got a two terabyte storage. Uh, and I haven't deleted any programs since January. So, but I, 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 that, that, that's more than anyone needs. I mean, I started on a 200 gigabyte hard drive, I think, for my storage. Can you not, like, squish them down a bit so that they take up less space? Yeah, you can. Then you lose the quality. But, yeah. Well, no, but if, if, if quality wasn't your, you know, if you're watching it on a 14-inch TV in the bedroom, quality might not be your, yeah. you know, primary concern. Well, the, the disk space well, might One be. of the options that Myth TV actually has is uh, user jobs. And that means that when a recording's finished is you can set it to automatically or by option uh, set uh, tasks that happen. So you could compress and reduce to uh, a compressed file format automatically. Or uh, one thing that a lot of people do do and is installed by default on the Ubuntu ones is uh, commercial uh, scanning. So it will actually automatically look for commercials in the recordings. How well does it do that? Reasonably well. It's particularly good on American programmes. Um, because it looks for things like black splashes and difference in the screen picture, like the resolution, whether it's widescreen. You know, it looks for different things like that, maybe logos in the corner. I don't know the specifics of that, but it's, it's reasonably good. You say that you've got a remote, so it's a PC, so I don't have to sit there with a keyboard and a mouse in my living room. <laughs> yeah. It supports remote controls. Yeah. Um, I mean, mo- most um, tuner cards these days actually come with remote controls and that they are generally supported. Uh, you can also use um, other ones via... Uh, there's a serial connection, there's a USB connection. So, yeah, I mean, you can you can get remotes. And you can get remotes for, for le- less than £10 that, that come with the receiver. Sorry, you said you've got the back end, and is it is it, you'd have the remote 
pointing to the front end. Yeah. And yeah. the front end would be the thing that sits under your telly. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I like to try and not give the impression it's a computer. Uh, like I, I've got a, a slimline case, which is the same size as a DVD player. And you wouldn't know it's not a DVD player. Um, and I like the fact that when people come around, they don't know I'm actually watching TV through a computer. I, I don't tell them, but I, I like the fact that I've just got a, a pretty interface. What about the value-added features? Um, as I understand it, it's not just um, TV and TV playback and recording. There are all sorts of other little plugins and things that you can add into it to extend the functionality. Yeah, I mean, you, you get the base one where you just watch and record programs. Uh, but you've also got another one called Myth DVD for watching DVDs, Myth Video for watching videos. Uh, there's a, a, a radio plugin which is under development. There's a crazy one called Myth Recipe, uh, which is <laughs> for displaying recipes. Wow, uh, who'd have thought it? <laughs> but yeah, there, there's, there's quite a few plugins that are available. Dave, tell me more about the DVD side. I don't watch the TV a lot, but I've got a lot of films. Can I convert my hundreds of DVDs, um, put them on the back end, and then have multiple PCs in the house play back any film? Yes, you can. Yes, um, you can rip it into ISO format and Myth TV will support playing back from the ISO. That would be really big, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean... Like four to nine gig per yeah, film or something. Yeah, so I mean, if you want perfect quality, that that's how you do it. But you can also, say, insert a DVD and say, I want to, to copy this. And you, you can compress it as well to what option you choose. You said uh, about multiple PCs around the house. So if I've got a back-end PC that's like medium to low spec and it's got the TV tuner cards in it and that's running the Myth TV back-end and then I have a front-end under the telly in my lounge which looks like a DVD player and I can use the menu and the remote control. That all sounds great. But you said you can have multiple front-ends. So I could have one in my bedroom. Yeah, I mean, just the other day I was using my laptop as a front-end which is a tablet so I can fold the screen around and using that wirelessly with good signal it works quite well so you don't have to wire up your whole house with ethernet you could use wireless well yes although what, what's the limitation is it the speed that yeah i mean uh if you if i've got bad signal it will be juttering i mean i, I would recommend ethernet or, or power over ethernet, uh, uh, ethernet. ethernet over power yeah yeah <laughs> mid tv has two options it's got an inbuilt streamer uh it's got its own protocol uh, but it can also support reading from the file system. Uh, so if you've got an NFS or, or Samba share mounted to the front end, you can also make it so the front end will actually read that file directly rather than string. So if I've got a, a box with some files on, like one of those little NAS boxes you can buy that shares out disk space over Samba and NFS, I could use that? Is that what you're saying? Well, the, the new Myth TV that's coming out actually supports storage groups. Uh, so you could mount that as a storage location on the back end. Right. There's another feature that you've mentioned to me in the past that sounded quite interesting, which was um, for, for my situation, when I'm at work, well, when I'm not at work, but in the evenings when I'm not at work, but working away from home, I'm, I'm staying in a place where I don't have a TV aerial. So I, I can't watch TV, but I have internet access. So I'm recording programs at home. Would it be easy for me to watch the programs that I've recorded at home from another location if I've got internet access? Yeah, I mean, MythWeb, as I think I mentioned earlier on, it's actually got inbuilt streaming, uh, which actually does uh, uses Flash. Uh, it's, it's not great quality. I, I would liken it to the BBC iPlayer uh, for, for the quality. Uh, well, it did has go to full screen, but it's also quite dependent on your upstream bandwidth as well. It, oh, of course, yeah. Sorry, is that Flash-generated uh, playback in the new version? Yes, yeah, the right. new one, which is 0.21, which is only released about a month ago, but it'll be in Hardy, and it's been backported to Gutsy. All right, because when I've looked at the previous version, I think the version that's in, currently in Gutsy, it, it just allows you to download the whole mm. uh, video file in one big chunk, Yeah. Um, which obviously, because they're so large, can be a, a bit of a long process yeah. if you're miles away over a half kilo, uh, half a meg ADSL line or something. Well, well the new version of Myth TV uh, is standard in Hardy, and it, it's in the Gutsy backports repository as well, and, and, and upgrades have, have been safe. What does Myth Ubuntu give us that taking a normal Ubuntu and installing Myth TV on it via the packages doesn't give us? Well, I, I think the major thing is is the is the quickness of setup. Uh, I mean, if, uh, as I understand it, you're currently running Myth TV and Ubuntu. I installed, yeah, I installed Myth TV on Ubuntu Edgy when that was current, so 18 months ago. Yeah. Um, and that was fine. Um, it, you know, it supported the hardware and 
it was a case of working through the setup routine, which was okay to do, but I, I'm, I know I'm a technical user. I was able to do it. Um, and it's been upgraded since then. But I'm still guessing uh, that it took you at least a couple of hours to set up. Yeah, one or two. <laughs> a couple of weeks, wasn't it, Tony? Well, in, in some respects, it took two years. <laughs> <laughs> I started buying the hardware a couple of years before I finally got to a point where I was saying, this is ready and, and this works. I must say, Tony, I've been to your house a few times since then, and I've never seen it running. <laughs> well, it runs all the time, and it records. In all honesty, it's the only thing we've used for recording TV and watching TV for the last 18 months or so. It took a long time for kind of get the hardware and, and for all the bits of drivers and things to make their way into the kernel. But once I had my hand on an Ubuntu Edgy CD, it took, I don't know, four, six hours from going from bare metal hardware to having it all set up and running and MythWeb and all the bits and bobs working. Now, six hours is not an insignificant amount of time, but uh, compared with the previous revisions, which are running on Debian and you have to SSH in and export environment variables and use complex zine command lines to watch any TV, uh, it's somewhat more user-friendly just to have a remote... So if you used the, des- the Ubuntu desktop of Edgy to install that? I used the alternate CD ah. because I wanted to be able to... I didn't want to have to run a full desktop environment on my yes. relatively low power, um, it was small form factor box. Uh, so it literally it has the alternate CD installed to command line with no, no desktop. Um, and just X, no desktop environment on top of that. X automatically starts and that automatically starts the front end. And if the front end crashes for some reason, it will re- automatically restart the front end. So we've got over the phone call saying, I can't watch any TV <laughs> because your rubbish box is broken. Uh, and there's a big green button on the uh, remote control, which is uh, linked to kill minus nine uh, myths <laughs> front end. So if for some reason the playback locks up and, it, uh, and you get a hardware funk, whack the button, it'll restart the front end, which happens very, very occasionally. The, the, the least stable module seems to be myth music. Uh, so you mean you've actually partly answered it there. The fact that you had to use the alternate CD or have used the desktop CD for a live CD installation, uh, you would have a bloated desktop. I mean, you would have open office on a TV. Mm. So so I think I think that's one of the major things uh, Mythbuntu actually offers is the fact that you can insert the CD and you know within an hour you you're going to have you can be watching channels. Uh, I think the other thing is is that you can actually use the CD as a front end from the live environment which which is quite a nice What feature. without installing. So if I've yes. got a spare PC and I just want to try out a front end I can yeah. whack the CD in and But I, I I still think you should probably treat it as the same as you would with the Ubuntu desktop live. Yeah, CD. just trying it out. Yeah, I mean you wouldn't want that for production use. Could you run it off like a USB key on a on a small form factor diskless you've raised a good point there our actual new feature cool. uh, well our new feature actually supports that and it's uh, Ubuntu diskless uh, sorry Mythbuntu diskless you can either it's got two options you can either use it from the from a USB key hmm. uh, but the real thing is is actually booting PXE which is basically diskless um, and it, right. and it, it, it gets its whole image from the from the back end and that's very fast and very efficient and, and that, that's where I think the future is going and that, that way you can have something there's literally no fans no moving parts in your front end very low current draw and you can have as many of them around the house as you want, really. Mm. And just add another one is trivial. It could fire up. That would be really quite cool. I mean, the only problem is, is some of the smaller ones don't actually support PXE, and that's why you have to use the USB as a boot device. Right. Is it an official Ubuntu project, or is it something that's done by a few people in the spare time or something? Or? Well, well, we're just over a year old, and within a couple of months, uh, we approached the community council for blessing, and they granted with it without any problems. So, yes, I mean, we're, we're an official Ubuntu project, but we're not supported by Canonical. So, And your packages are in the standard yeah. Ubuntu repository. Well, that, that was one of our founding things. It was that everything we do, we push back to the normal Ubuntu repositories. So you can get Mythbuntu functionality from the normal Ubuntu repository. I think I saw a how-to that said you could take a standard Ubuntu desktop and then, you know, just add a bunch of packages that are in the repository and off you go. You've got MythTV. And obviously, from your point of view, that's not how you want people to do it. You would want people to use MythBuntu because that's how you tailor the application, I guess. It doesn't if, really if, matter. If they're using MythTV, they can use whatever desktop they want. Uh, we actually ship the XFCE one, which is the same one as Ubuntu has. But if they install the Mythbuntu desktop package, which is, you know, uh, designed in the same way as Ubuntu desktop, Kubuntu desktop, uh, then they will actually be provided with the same functionality. And they, it, it would look as though they did actually install from Mythbuntu. Cool. Does it tie in with the releases of Ubuntu? Yeah, we've currently got a beta out, uh, which um, is, go- is undergoing testing. And, um, yeah, so we should be uh, pretty much following in the same release schedule as Ubuntu and uh, probably about the same time as Kubuntu comes out. Cool. And you can find further information at mythbuntu.org. 
we had a few emails this week. Uh, one from Paul O'Malley asking us if we ever thought of doing audio tutorials with a web page of commands to give the extra layer of polish. I think what he's suggesting here is that we have some kind of tech talk teaching people how to do stuff within the podcast. What do you guys think about that? It's an interesting suggestion. Audio is probably not the best way of giving over complex uh, commands, hence the uh, the document accompanying it. It would take a lot of work to polish and get right. And is it is it worth doing given there are other resources like the wiki and documentation and stuff? The Ubuntu Wiki is one of the major plus points of the community. There's so much stuff already documented on there. I worry, worry about creating a second version of that almost if we were to be hugely successful at it. And we'd also become out of date and not editable. Yeah, and it would mean a lot of work. It's quite a lot of work just putting the podcast together, never mind writing tutorials as well. Having said that, maybe there are members of the community who are interested in contributing tutorials. So what do you think, Dave? I think that might be a suggestion, but I don't know. Audience, let us know what you want. Emails to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. We had an email from Michael G. Fletcher uh, on our segment about would you go back? And he says that one of the things that has helped him not have to go back is using virtualization. He uses VirtualBox from virtualbox.org, and it's also packaged in Ubuntu, to give him a Windows installation. So for the very few uh, w- Windows applications he still needs, he can run it in unified mode, which makes it appear as if it's a native Linux app on his desktop. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Having Windows applications on top of your GNOME or KDE desktop, it's quite nice having it all seamlessly integrated together. It works quite well. Yeah, so for example, Simon was saying about having to install Windows so that your wife could do ECDL. Yeah. So one, one of the things that Michael suggested is you could just run it inside VirtualBox in unified mode, yeah. still get access to Office, and uh, not have to install the Windows yeah. OS. Good idea. Thanks there's, for that. there's a great tutorial, actually, on the uh, Ubuntu Wiki. If you go to wiki.ubuntu.com slash VirtualBox, a tutorial on how to get that working. Okay, he also suggests that we might want to talk more about virtualization in future episodes, because it's quite a big subject, and we might just do that. <laughs> Right, so episode three in the can. Yeah, nice one. I'm off to Lug Radio Live in the USA. If you're going over there, um, come along and say hello. I'll be working the video crew, so I'll probably have a video camera on me. And also, the next episode might be a couple of days late as a result, because I'm flying back and we're going to have to delay the recording by a day or so. Slacker. Canonical have given us approval to use the Ubuntu trademark in our podcast, which is good news. Yep, so you can keep track of what we're up to on our Twitter feed, which is twitter.com slash UUPC. You can email us at podcast at ubuntu-uk.org if you've got any suggestions for the show or if you've recorded any material or tips or anything for us just uh, please email us join us on irc on the free network at tashubuntu-uk okay we'll see you next time bye bye see ya. bye